after studying this module you would be able to learn about the divergent construals of self analyze the cognitive emotional and motivational implications of the self system examine the modes of self and gender understand the processes related to self and inner growth The self is first and foremost the collection of beliefs that we hold about ourselves. What are our important characteristics? What are we good at? What do we do poorly? What kinds of situations do we prefer or avoid? One person may think of herself as a black woman who plans to become a sociology professor. another might think of himself as not academically inclined but good at most sports a third person may think of herself primarily in terms of a future goal such as the desire to become the biggest real estate mogul in the midwest the set of beliefs we hold about who we are is called the self concept often we have a clear idea of who we are whereas at other times we hold self doubts and confusion and we feel we are buffeted by external pressures and evaluations by others this distinction refers to self concept clarity and a sense of self that is clearly and confidently defined providing a coherent sense of direction self esteem is the evaluation we make of ourselves that is we are concerned not only with what we are like but also with how we value these qualities people with high self esteem have a clear sense of what their personal qualities are they think well of themselves set appropriate goals use feedback in a self enhancing manner savor their positive experiences and cope successfully with difficult situations for example when people with high self esteem receive feedback implying that they have been rejected by others they are more likely than those with low self esteem to respond by reminding themselves of their positive qualities or by persisting at an alternative goal and conveniently people with high self esteem remember their daily experiences more favorably a memory bias that may itself strengthen high self esteem in addition to our overall sense of self esteem we hold specific evaluations of our abilities in particular areas puja may think well of herself generally but may know that she is not very diplomatic and not very talented artistically dinesh may generally think poorly of himself but know that he is organized and a good pianist two dimensions that are central to self esteem are self competence and self liking that is evaluations of ourselves as capable and personal fondness for the self the importance and value we attach to these more specific self views also influence global feelings of self worth that is people are selective about the domains on which they base their self worth for one person being attractive might be important for another person being smart might be more important for the most part researchers have studied people's explicit self esteem that is the concrete positive or negative evaluations they make of themselves but more recent research suggests the importance of implicit self esteem as well implicit self esteem refers to the less conscious evaluations we make of ourselves studies of implicit self esteem sometimes reveal things that studies of explicit self esteem do not for example implicit self esteem seems to be more sensitive than explicit self esteem to the specific situation a person is in as we will see one strong cultural difference is that asians especially the japanese are much less likely to answer explicit self esteem scales in a self enhancing manner instead 
they report relatively modest self-esteem. However, in a test of implicit self-esteem, Japanese students were found to hold a preference for alphabetical letters contained in their own names over letters that were not in their names. They were also found to prefer numbers that corresponded to the month or the day of their birthdays over numbers that did not appear in their birthdays. These measures of implicit self-esteem then suggested a self-enhancing quality that the students did not acknowledge more directly. How does a sense of self develop? One of the most influential theories of how the self develops was put forth by Eric Erickson, 1963, who argued for a stage theory of ego development. He maintained that although identity formation is a lifelong task, it is of critical importance during adolescence and young adulthood. This time, when identity begins to come together, marks the transition between childhood and adulthood. Erickson in 1963 believed that the goal of this process is the ability to experience oneself as something that has continuity and sameness and to act accordingly. Once the young adult has acquired a firm sense of identity, he or she has a basis for making job or career plans and for establishing intimate relationships. Although Erickson was no doubt correct in his assessment of adolescence and young ad adulthood as pivotal times for developing a sense of self, it would be false to claim that the sense develops and is maintained only or primarily during this time. The sense of self begins in infancy with the recognition that one is a separate individual. Very young children have fairly clear concepts of their personal qualities and what they do or don't do well. Moreover, many changes occur in middle and late adulthood that may influence the self-conceptions that people hold. Thus, although psychologists continue to believe that Erickson was essentially right when he argued that issues of identity are especially important in adolescence and young adulthood, it is also clearly the case that the development of a personal sense of self is a lifelong process that begins in childhood and never truly ends. After studying this module, you shall be able to learn about the divergent construals of self, analyze the cognitive implications of the self system, identify the emotional implications of the self system, evaluate the motivational implications of the self system, psychologically examine the social consequences of the self system, learn about the divergent construals of self, and understand the processes related to self and inner growth. In America, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. In Japan, the nail that stands out gets pounded down. American parents who are trying to induce their children to eat their suppers are fond of saying, think of the starving kids in Ethiopia and appreciate how lucky you are to be different from them. Japanese parents are likely to say, think about the farmer who worked so hard to produce this rice for you. If you do not eat it, he will feel bad, for his efforts will have been in vain. A small Texas corporation seeking to elevate productivity told its employees to look in the mirror and say, I am beautiful, hundred times before coming to work each day. Employees for a Japanese supermarket that was recently opened in New Jersey were instructed to begin the day by holding hands and telling each other he or she is beautiful. Such anecdotes suggest that people in Japan and America 
may hold strikingly divergent construals of the self, other, and the interdependence of the two. The American examples stress attending to the self, the appreciation of one's difference from others, and the importance of asserting the self. The Japanese examples emphasize attending to and fitting in with others and the importance of harmonious interdependence with them. These construals of the self and others are tied to the implicit and normative tasks that various cultures hold for what people should be doing in their lives. Anthropologists and psychologists assume that such construals can influence and in many cases determine the very nature of individual experience. Despite the growing psychological and anthropological evidence that people hold divergent views about the self, most of what psychologists currently know about human nature is based on one particular view, the so-called Western view of the individual as an independent, self-contained, autonomous entity who comprises a unique configuration of internal attributes and behaves primarily as a consequence of these internal attributes. As a result of this monocultural approach to the self, psychologists' understanding of those phenomena that are linked in one way or another to the self may be unnecessarily restricted. Marcus and Kitayama compare an independent view of the self with one other very different view, that is, an interdependent view. The independent view is most clearly exemplified in some sizable segment of American culture as well as in many Western European cultures. The interdependent view is exemplified in Japanese culture as well as in other Asian cultures. But it is also characteristic of African cultures, Latin American cultures and many Southern European cultures. These divergent views of the self have systematic influence on various aspects of cognition, emotion, and motivation. With respect to cognition, for those with interdependent selves, in contrast to those with independent selves, some aspect of knowledge representation and some of the processes involved in social and non-social thinking are influenced by a pervasive attentiveness to the relevant others in the social context. Thus, one's actions are more likely to be seen as situationally bound and characterizations of the individual will include this context. Furthermore, for those with interdependent construals of the self, both the expression and experience of emotions and motives may be significantly shaped and governed by a consideration of the reaction of others. Specifically, for example, some emotions like anger that derive from and promote an independent view of the self may be less prevalent among those with interdependent selves and self-serving motives may be replaced by what appear as other serving motives. Independent and interdependent modes of self closely correspond to the individualism or collectivism syndrome. People in individualistic cultures often give priority to their personal goals, even when they conflict with the goals of important in groups. Individualism is very high in the United States and is generally high in English-speaking countries. In collectivist culture, 
the self is defined in terms of membership in in-group which influences a wide range of social behaviors. Collectivists are usually organized hierarchically and tend to be concerned about the results of their actions on members of their in-group. They share resources with in-group members and feel interdependent and involved in their lives. A relationship orientation is very common. They tend to follow social norms and maintain normative or obligatory relationships. The interdependent mode of self-construal questions the decontextualized individualistic view of self and locates self in the social, spiritual, divine context. Such a model is prevalent in Japan, Korea, China and India. It is held that self is inseparable from the surrounding context and people. The goal of self-development is not individuation, but dissolving the self-other boundary. Such models assume that an individual is an open system who communicates with other selves. To realize one's self is not to express the internal attributes, but to become part of a group, community, and of divinity. Its strategies invite self-control and self-discipline. As Yoga Sutras proclaim, yoga or union is the goal and controlling the mental functioning is its means. The Indian self appears to be continuous with others, shares its space and is in immediate relation with them. The individual develops through participation in the unity of all things and it requires emphasis on diverse goals which include engagement as well as dissociation and detainment. Interpersonal behavior depends on the factors of role, place and relationship. Kakar has noted that the basis of relationship is mutual caring, involvement, and emotional affinity. Empirical studies of self-construal in the Indian context indicate greater prevalence of social identity and contextually in self-descriptions. Mishra and Giri observed that both interdependent as well as independent kinds of self-construal were present among Indians. In a study, Srivastava and Mishra reported that the descriptions involving social identity were predominant over autonomous self-descriptions. It was also noted that independent and interdependent life goals were moderately positively related. A number of researchers have noticed that there is a considerable degree of tolerance for dissonance and coexistence of disparate elements in the Indian worldview and experience of self. Schweder et al. have shown that the moral discourse in the Indian context is situated in the context of autonomy, community and divinity. Mescalo et al. found that individual and relational concepts of self were present both in Indian and American samples. The cultural differences arose in the specific ways the two nations were constructed. We therefore need to look within as well as between cultures. The indigenous Indian perspective on self goes beyond the dichotomies and presents an alternative model which would unfold in the subsequent modules. If a cognitive activity implicates the self, the outcome of this activity will depend on the nature of the self-system.
Specifically, there are three important consequences of these divergent self-systems for cognition. First, we may expect those with interdependent selves to be more attentive and sensitive to others than those with independent selves. The attentiveness and sensitivity to others characterizing the interdependent selves will result in a relatively greater cognitive elaboration of the other or of the self in relation to other. Second, among those with interdependent selves, the unit of representation of both the self and the other will include a relatively specific social context in which the self and the other are embedded. This means that knowledge about persons, either the self or others, will not be abstract and generalized across contexts, but instead will remain specific to the focal context. Third, a consideration of the social context and the reactions of others may also shape some basic non-social cognitive activities such as categorizing and counterfactual thinking. In exploring the impact of divergent cultural construals on thinking, it is assumed that how people think in a social situation cannot be easily separated from what they think about. Extensive research on social cognition in the past decade has suggested the power of content in social inference. It is the nature of the representation that guides attention and that determines what other relevant information will be retrieved to fill in the gap of available sense data. For example, investigations by D. Andrade and Johnson Laird indicate that the greater the familiarity with the stimulus materials the more elaborate the schemata for framing the problem and the better the problem solving. In general, then, how a given object is culturally constructed and represented in memory should importantly influence and even determine how one think about the object. Accordingly, the divergent representations of the self should be expected to have various consequences for all cognition relevant to self, others, or social relationships. If the most significant elements of the interdependent self are the self in relation to others elements, there will be a need, as well as a strong normative demand for knowing and understanding the social surrounding, particularly others in direct interaction with the self. That is, if people conceive of themselves as interdependent parts of larger social wholes, it is important for them to be sensitive to and knowledgeable about the others who are the co-participants in various relationships and about the social situations that enable these relationships. Maintaining one's relationships and ensuring a harmonious social interaction requires a full understanding of these others, that is, knowing how they are feeling, thinking, and likely to act in the context of one's relationships to them. It follows that those with interdependent cells may develop a dense and richly elaborated store of information about others or of the self in relation as compared to those with independent cells whose representation of the self is more elaborated and distinctive in memory than the representation of another person. A second consequence of having an interdependent self 
as opposed to an independent self concerns the ways in which knowledge about self and other is processed, organized and retrieved from memory. For example, given an interdependent self, knowledge about the self may not be organized into a hierarchical structure with the person's characteristic attributes as the superordinate nodes, as is often assumed in characterizations of the independent self. In other words, those with interdependent selves are less likely to organize knowledge about the self in general or about the other in general. Specific social situations are more likely to serve as the unit of representation than are attributes of separate persons. One learns about the self with respect to a specific other in a particular context and conversely about the other with respect to the self in a particular context. In exploring variations in the nature of person's knowledge, Schweder and Bourne asked respondents in India and America to describe several close acquaintances. The descriptions provided by the Indians were more situationally specific and more relational than those of Americans. Indians' descriptions focused on behavior. They described what was done, where it was done, and to whom or with whom it was done. The Indian respondent said, He has no land to cultivate, but likes to cultivate the lands of others. Or, when a quarrel arises, he cannot resist the temptation of saying a word. Or, he behaves properly with guests, but feels sorry if money is spent on them. It is the behavior itself that is focal and significant rather than the inner attribute that supposedly underlines it. Notably, this tendency to provide the specific situational or interpersonal context when providing a description was reported to characterize the free descriptions of Indians regardless of social class, education or literacy level. It appears then that the concreteness in person's description is not due to a lack of skill in abstracting concrete instances to form a general proposition, but rather a consequence of the fact that global inferences about persons are typically regarded as not meaningful or informative. Americans also describe other people in terms of the specifics of their behavior, but typically this occurs only at the beginning of relationships when the other is relatively unknown or if the behavior is somehow distinctive and does not readily lend itself to a trait characterization. Rather than saying, he does not disclose secrets. Americans are more likely to say, he is discreet or principled. Rather than, he is hesitant to give his money away, Americans say, he is tight or selfish. Schweder and Bourne found that 46% of American descriptions were of the context-free variety, whereas this was true of only 20% from the Indian sample. A study by Miller on patterns of explanation among Indian Hindus and Americans revealed the same tendency for contextual and relational descriptions of behavior among Indian respondents. This preference for contextual explanations has also been documented by Dalal, Sharma and Bisht. This is also evidenced when those with interdependent selves provide self-descriptions. Cousins compared 
the self descriptions of american high school and college students he used two types of free response formats the original 20 statements test which simply asks who am i 20 consecutive times and a modified tst which asks subjects to describe themselves in several specific situations when responding to the original tst the japanese self descriptions were more concrete and rule specific in contrast the american descriptions included more psychological trait or attribute characterizations however in the modified tst where a specific interpersonal context was provided so that respondents could envision the situation and presumably who was there and what was being done to whom or by whom this pattern of result was reversed cousins argued that the original tst essentially isolates or disembeds the i from the relational or situational context and thus self description becomes artificial for the japanese respondents who are more accustomed to thinking about themselves within specific social situations for these respondents the contextualized format describe yourself as you are with your family was more natural because it locates the self in a habitual unit of representation namely in a particular interpersonal situation once a defining context was specified the japanese respondents were decidedly more willing to make generalizations about their behavior and to describe themselves abstractly using trait or attribute characterizations in contrast american students were more at home with the original tst because this test elicits the type of abstract situation free self descriptions that form the core of the american independent self concept such abstract or global characterizations according to cousins reflect a claim of being a separate individual whose nature is not bound by a specific situation when responding to the contextualized self description questions for american respondents selfness pure and simple seems to transcend any particular interpersonal relationships one's view of self can have an impact even on some evidently non-social cognitive activities liu described the emphasis that the chinese place on being loyal and pious to their superiors and obedience to them whether they are parents employees or government officials he claimed that most chinese adhere to a specific rule that states if your superiors are present or indirectly involved in any situation then you are to respect and obey them the power and the influence of this rule appear to go considerably beyond that provided by the american admonition to respect one's elders liu argued that the standard of self regulation that involves the attention and consideration of others is so pervasive that it may actually constrain verbal and ideational fluency he reasoned that taking account of others in every situation is often at odds with individual assertion or with attempts at innovation or unique expression this means for example that in an unstructured creativity task in which the goal is to generate as many ideas as possible 
Chinese subjects may be at a relative disadvantage. In a similar vein, Liu and Su suggested that consideration of the rule respect and obey others uses up cognitive capacity that might otherwise be devoted to a task and this may be the reason that Chinese norms for some creativity tasks fall below American norms. Charting the differences between an independent self and interdependent self the discussion by Bloom, Orr, Moser, Lebra, and Stevenson et al. thus far implies that regardless of the nature of the self-system, most people with an adequate level of education possess the skills of hypothetical reasoning and the ability to think in a counterfactual fashion. Yet, the application of these skills in a particular situation varies considerably with the nature of the self-system. Some people may invoke these skills much more selectively. For those with interdependent selves, in contrast to those with independent selves, a relatively greater proportion of all inferences will be contingent on the pragmatic implications of a given situation, such as the perceived demands of the interviewer, the convention of the situation, and the rules of conversation. Do styles of thinking and inference vary above and beyond those that derive from the pragmatic considerations of particular social situations? Given the tendency to see people, events, and objects as embedded within particular situations and relationships, the possibility seems genuine. Chu, for example, claimed that the reasoning of American children is characterized by an inferential categorical style, whereas the reasoning of Taiwanese Chinese subjects display a relational contextual style. When American children described why two objects of a set of three objects went together, they were likely to say, because they both live on a farm. In contrast, Chinese children were more likely to display a relational contextual style, putting two human figures together and claiming the two go together because the mother takes care of the baby. In the latter case, the emphasis is on synthesizing features into an organized whole. Brunner referred to such differences as arising from a paradigmatic versus a narrative mode of thought. In the former, the goal is abstraction and analyzing common features. In the latter, establishing a connection or an interdependence among the elements. In psychology, emotion is often viewed as a universal set of largely pre-wired internal processes of self-maintenance and self-regulation. This does not mean, though, that emotional experience is also universal. On the contrary, as suggested by anthropologists Rosaldo, Lutz, and Solomon, culture can play a central role in shaping emotional experience. As with cognition, if an emotional activity or reaction implicates the self, the outcome of this activity will depend on the nature of the self-system. Among psychologists, Several cognitively oriented theorists of emotion have suggested that emotion is importantly implicated and embedded in an actual social situation as construed by the person. Accordingly, not only does the experience of an emotion depend on the current construal of the social situation,
but the experienced emotion in turn plays a pivotal role in changing and transforming the very nature of the social situation by allowing a new construal of the situation to emerge and furthermore by instigating the person to engage in certain actions. From the current perspective, construals of the social situation are constrained by and largely derived from construals of the self, others and the relationship between the two. Thus, emotional experience should vary systematically with the construal of the self. The present analysis suggests several ways in which emotional processes may differ with the nature of the self system. First, the predominant eliciting conditions of many emotions may differ markedly according to one's construal of the self. Second, and more important, which emotions will be expressed or experienced and with what intensity and frequency may also vary dramatically. The emotions systematically vary according to the extent to which they follow from and also foster and reinforce an independent or an interdependent construal of the self. Some emotions such as anger, frustration and pride have the individual's internal attributes as the primary referent. Such emotions may be called ego-focused. They result most typically from the blocking, the satisfaction or the confirmation of one's internal attributes. Experiencing and expressing these emotions further highlights these self-defining internal attributes and leads to additional attempts to assert them in public and confirm them in private. As a consequence, for those with independent selves to operate effectively, they have to be experts in the expression and experience of these emotions. They will manage the expression and even the experience of these emotions so that they maintain, affirm and bolster the construal of the self as an autonomous entity. The public display of one's own internal attributes can be at odds with the maintenance of interdependent, cooperative social interaction and when unchecked can result in interpersonal confrontation, conflict and possibly even overt aggression. These negative consequences, however, are not as severe as they might be for interdependent selves because the expression of one's internal attributes is the culturally sanctioned task of the independent self. In short, the current analysis suggests that, in contrast to those with more interdependent selves, the ego-focused emotions will be more frequently expressed and perhaps experienced by those with independent selves. In contrast to the ego-focused emotions, some other emotions such as sympathy, feelings of interpersonal communion and shame have another person rather than one's internal attributes as the primary referent. Such emotions may be called other focused. They typically result from being sensitive to the other, taking the perspective of the other and attempted to promote interdependence. Experiencing these emotions highlights one's interdependence, facilitates the reciprocal exchange of well-intended actions, 
leads to further cooperative social behavior and thus provides a significant form of self-validation of interdependent selves. As a consequence, for those with interdependent selves to operate effectively, they will have to be experts in the expression and experience of these emotions. They will manage the expression and even the experience of these emotions so that they maintain, affirm and reinforce the construal of the self as an interdependent entity. The other focused emotions often discourage the autonomous expression of one's internal attributes and may lead to inhibition and ambivalence. Although among independent selves, these consequences are experienced negatively and can, in fact, have a negative impact, they are tolerated among interdependent selves as the business of living. Creating and maintaining a connection to others is the primary task of the interdependent self. In short, this analysis suggests that in contrast to those with more independent selves, these other focused emotions will be more frequently expressed and perhaps even experienced among those with interdependent selves. In a comparison of American and Japanese undergraduates, Matsumoto, Kudo, Schrerer, and Walbert found that American subjects reported experiencing their emotions longer than the Japanese subjects, even though the two groups agreed in their ordering of which emotions were experienced longest. Americans also reported feeling these emotions more intensely than the Japanese and reported more bodily symptoms than did the Japanese. Finally, when asked what they would do to cope with the consequences of various emotional events, significantly more of the Japanese students reported that no action was necessary. One interpretation of this pattern of findings may assume that most of the emotions examined, with the exception of shame and possibly guilt, are what are called as ego-focused emotions. Thus, people with independent selves will attend more to these feelings and act on the basis of them because these feelings are regarded as diagnostic of the independent self. Not to attend to one's inner feelings is often viewed as being inauthentic or even as denying the real self. In contrast, among those with more interdependent selves, one's inner feelings may be less important in determining one's consequent actions. Ego-focused feelings may be regarded as byproducts of interpersonal relationships, but they may not be accorded privileged status as regulators of behavior. For those with interdependent selves, it is the interpersonal context that assumes priority over the inner attributes, such as private feelings. The latter may need to be controlled or de-emphasized so as to effectively fit into the interpersonal context. Given these differences in emotional processes, people with divergent selves may develop very different assumptions about the etiology of emotional expression for ego-focused emotions. For those with independent selves, Emotional expressions may literally express or reveal the inner feelings such as anger, sadness and fear.
For those with interdependent cells, however, an emotional expression may or may not be related directly to the inner feelings. Consistent with this analysis, Matsumoto, using data from 15 cultures, reported that individuals from hierarchical cultures, when asked to rate the intensity of an angry, sad, or fearful emotion displayed by an individual in a photograph, gave lower intensity ratings than those from less hierarchical cultures. Notably, although the degree of hierarchy inherent in one's cultures was strongly related to the intensity ratings given to those emotions, it was not related to the correct identification of these emotions. The one exception to this finding was that People from more hierarchical cultures were less likely to correctly identify emotional expressions of happiness. Among those with interdependent selves, positive emotional expressions are most frequently used as public actions in the service of maintaining interpersonal harmony and thus are not regarded as particularly diagnostic of the actor's inner feelings or happiness. For those with interdependent selves, it may be very important not to have intense experience of ego-focused emotions. And this may be particularly true for negative emotions like anger. Anger may seriously threaten an interdependent self and thus may be highly dysfunctional. In fact, some anthropologists explicitly challenge the universalist view that all people experience the same negative emotions. Thus, in Tahiti, anger is highly feared and various anthropological accounts claim that there is no expression of anger in this culture. It is not that these people have learned to inhibit or suppress their real anger, but that they have learned the importance of attending to others, considering others, and being gentle in all situations. And as a consequence, very little anger is elicited. In other words, the social reality is construed and actually constructed in such a way that it does not lend itself to the strong experience, let alone the outburst of negative ego-focused emotions such as anger. The same is claimed for Ukta Eskimos. They are said not to feel anger, not to express anger, and not even to talk about anger. The claim is that they do not show anger even in those circumstances that would certainly produce complete outrage in Americans. These Eskimos use a word that means childish to label angry behavior when it is observed in foreigners. Among the Japanese, there is a similar concern with averting anger and avoiding a disruption of the harmony of the social situation. As a consequence, experiencing anger or receiving anger signals may be relatively rare events. In the West, a controversy exists about the need, the desirability and the importance of expressing one's anger. Some argue that it is necessary to express anger so as to avoid boiling over or blowing up at a later point. Others argue for the importance of controlling one's anger so as not to risk losing control. Matsumoto et al. also found that Japanese respondents appear to be avoiding anger in close relations.
specifically for the Japanese, closely related others were rarely implicated in the experience of anger. The Japanese reported feeling anger primarily in the presence of strangers. It thus appears that not only the expression but also the experience of such an ego-focused emotion as anger is effectively averted within an interdependent structure of relation. When anger arises, it happens outside of the existing interdependence as in confrontation with outgroups. In contrast, Americans and Western Europeans report experiencing anger primarily in the presence of closely related others. This is not surprising, given that expressing and experiencing ego-focused, even negative emotions is one viable way to assert and affirm the status of the self as an independent entity. Consistent with this analysis, Stepek, Weiner and Lee found that when describing situations that produce anger, Chinese subjects were much more likely than American subjects to describe a situation that happened to someone else. For Americans, the major stimulus to anger was the situation where the individual was the victim. Other emotions such as pride or guilt may also differ according to the nature of the mediating self system. As with anger, these expressions may be avoided or they will assume a somewhat different form. For example, if defined as being proud of one's own individual attributes, pride may mean hubris and its expression may need to be avoided for those with interdependent selves. Consistent with the idea, Stipek et al. found that the Chinese were decidedly less likely to claim their own successful efforts as a source of pride than were the Americans. These investigators also reported that the emotion of guilt takes on somewhat different connotations as well. Among those with independent selves who are more likely to hold stable, cross-situational beliefs and to consider them self-definitional, violating a law or a moral principle was the most frequently mentioned cause of guilt. Among Chinese, however, the most commonly reported source of guilt was hurting others psychologically. Those with interdependent selves may inhibit the experience or at least the expression of some ego-focused emotions, but they may have a heightened capacity for the experience and expression of those emotions that derive primarily from focusing on the other. In Japan and China, for example, there is a much greater incidence of co-sleeping, co-bathing and physical contact between mother and child than is typically true in most Western countries. The traditional Japanese mother carries the child on her back for a large part of the first two years. Lebra claimed that Japanese mothers teach their children to fear the pain of loneliness, whereas Westerners teach children how to be alone. Japanese and Chinese socialization practices may help the child develop an interdependent self in the first place. And at the same time, the capacity for the experience of a relatively greater variety of other focused emotions. In Japan, socialization practices that foster an intense closeness between mother and child 
give rise to the feeling of ame. Ame is typically defined as the sense of or the accompanying hope for being lovingly cared for and involves depending on and presuming another's indulgence. When a person experiences ame, she or he feels the freedom to do whatever he or she wills while being accepted and cared for by others with few strings attached. Some say ame is a type of complete acceptance, a phenomenal replication of the ideal mother-infant bond. Experiencing ame with respect to another person may be inherent in the formation and maintenance of a mutually reciprocal interdependent relationship with another person. If the other person accepts one's MA, the reciprocal relationship is symbolically completed, leading to a significant form of self-validation. If, however, the other person rejects one's ame, the relationship will be in jeopardy. Marcus and Kitayama derived five types of emotions. Ego-focused positive emotions. Yutukan or feeling superior. Pride and tukiyagari, feeling puffed up, are those that are most typically associated with the confirmation or fulfillment of one's internal attributes, such as abilities, desires, and needs. Ego-focused negative emotions, anger, futekuser, that is sulky feeling, and yokyo yumfuman, that is frustration, occur primarily when such internal attributes are blocked or threatened. Also included were those correspondingly positive or negative emotions associated with the maintenance or enhancement of interdependence. Three emotions are commonly associated with the affirmation or the completion of interdependent relationships. Fury or feeling of connection with someone Shitashimi or feeling of familiarity to someone, Sonki or feeling of respect for someone and thus what designated as positive and other focused. In contrast, some negative emotions are typically derived from one's failure to offer or reciprocate favors to relevant others and thus to fully participate in the relationship. They are thus closely linked to disturbance, to interdependence, and a consequent desire to repair the disturbance. They include oime, or feeling of indebtedness, shame, and guilt. Finally, interdependent selves are likely to tolerate ambivalence regarding one's interdependent status with some relevant others. Interestingly, some emotions are uniquely linked to this interpersonal ambivalence. Three such emotions, ame, tanomi, that is, feeling like relying on someone, and shugeri, that is, feeling like leaning on someone, were examined. There was a strong correlation between positive and negative ego-focused emotions. As may be expected, if both of them are derived from and also foster and reinforce an independent construal of self. Furthermore, these ego-focused emotions are clearly distinct from the other focused emotions. Thus, Neither positive nor negative ego-focused emotions had any significant relationship with other focused positive emotions. Interestingly, however, these ego-focused emotions 
were significantly associated with the ambivalent and to a larger extent with the negative other focused emotions, suggesting that the experience of ego focused emotions, either positive or negative, is readily accompanied, at least in Japanese culture, by the felt disturbance of a relationship and thus by a strong need to restore harmony. Alternatively, being embedded in a highly reciprocal relation and feeling obliged to contribute to the relationship may sometimes be perceived as a burden or pressure, hence rendering salient some of the ego-focused emotions. Finally, the three of other focused emotions are all positively correlated. The frequency of experiencing both positive and negative ego-focused emotions significantly increased with the independent construal of self. They were, however, either negatively related or unrelated to the interdependent construal of self. In marked contrast to this pattern for the ego-focused emotions, all three types of other focused emotions were significantly more frequently experienced by those with more interdependent construals of self. These emotions, however, were either unrelated or negatively related to the independent construal of self. Now to summarize what we have learned in this module. In this module, we noted some fundamental differences in self-conceptions, depending on cultural orientation. In particular, those from the United States and other Western cultures are often said to have an independent sense of self, whereas individuals from Eastern and Southern cultures are said to have a more interdependent sense of self. Because so, much of the research that has explored the self has come from Western cultures. The coverage of the self in this module has disproportionately emphasized characteristics of the independent self. We have already noted several self-relevant phenomena that appear to vary significantly from independent to interdependent cultures. For example, self-enhancement is ubiquitous in Western cultures and uncommon in interdependent cultures. It seems reasonable to assume that many of the other processes like self-affirmation, self-verification and self-consciousness, self-control and self-handicapping take a different form in cultures that construe the self in interdependent terms. Psychologists are only beginning to understand the self and the cultural differences in the ways in which the self is experienced. Although research on the self has assumed a clearer direction and focus over recent decades, it nonetheless leaves many important social psychological phenomena and issues to be explored.